faced the elements head on, working long days and nights, the Power Control Center kept the pulse as the storm rolled through the area and afterwards as repairs were made. We'll show you that and more on NTV. Hi, I'm Sharon Bennett reporting from the Power Control Center. And I'm Mike McClure. I work in residential energy management services and I'm happy to be here for this edition of NTV. Henry Yates has gone on to a job with the Port of Seattle. We'll talk more about our search for an NTV co-host later in this show. But first, we have a lot to show you this month on NTV, starting with the Power Control Center on Queen Anne. During a storm, the PCC is the nerve center, keeping track of feeders as they cycle out and of line crews as restorations are made. Two desks in this room work different sections of the city. The dispatchers give locations of problems to the crews via radio. John Roach was the senior dispatcher on duty when the storm hit. It was uh, very hectic. Um, we were swamped within probably a half an hour. And uh, we spent the first day basically putting the feeders back in. And uh, after that, the laterals, large laterals, and then down to, by the time the weekend came around, individual services. The jobs here are demanding. You need a cool head and the ability to think on your feet. While John's worked here a long time, this was Dana Wheelock's first storm. It was overwhelming. Um, I was working the north half of the city, and my partner Bob was handling the south half, and the storm started in the south end, and I thought it was just some routine um, um, lights out alarms that we were getting here and um, I had no indication that we were going to have a windstorm. When I showed up at work, it was calm outside, and, and I, I was uh, making light of the situation, the fact that the north end was pretty calm and the south end was getting a few alarms. And before I knew it, the north end was all lit up with alarms, and um, within a half hour after it started, it was, it was just overwhelming. This room keeps track of power generation and transmission how much power we need to keep the system operating, any power purchases to be made, or surplus power we have for sale. City Light has outgrown this power control center, which was built in the early 60s. Plans are underway for a new system control center, which will be built near the canal substation. Groundbreaking should begin in March. While there's a lot of action at the PCC during and after a major outage, our line crews bear the brunt of the storm's pressure. North and South crews were out in the field as the storm blew in. Their work was not to end soon. Shifts continued with 17 hours on, followed by seven hours rest. When it was all over, crews had a chance to review safety efforts on the job, as well as thank others who supported their efforts. We talked to crews about what it was like working through this crisis. Well, on this particular uh, storm right here, I thought it was devastating because uh, it locked out a lot of feeders, uh, just numerous uh, conditions uh, happened. Uh, anywhere from secondaries to primary wires were down. And uh, it, it was just, you know, it was just awesome, though, that uh, things were snarled, tall, uh, all tangled up, and uh, it was a big experience for me. I've never seen anything like this quite happen at the city. I've been in other storms, but. This severity of this one was devastating. Oh yeah, the customers, um, they were real nice, they were happy to see us. One lady told us they'd been out for three days and they didn't have any heat. And it felt kind of good to get them back online and drive by through the neighborhood and see them wave at you. Uh, it was everywhere, I mean, there were poles. I, I've never seen it where the poles just busted off like five in a row. You know, the transformers were on the ground. Um, everybody's services were out. We'd, we'd stop at a job to go up and repair one, and we'd have people line up in their cars behind us, come up and ask us, when are we going to get turned on? We're on the next block. Are you coming over? You have people coming out of their houses to watch us cut the trees down at night because it was dark. You couldn't see. You know, you have to put your spotlights up. It was real. It was a, it was a hairy situation, but we did it. Well, Friday night, uh, approximately 9 o'clock, we got called to a pole fire down by Canal Receiving Substation. It was one of our Highline uh, corner poles and the uh, 26 kV phase came off the, off the insulator and landed on the cross arm, which uh, rounded out to the pole and caught the pole on fire. This is a 95-foot pole, and it burned approximately uh, four to five feet off in the middle, 
and uh, we had to put a temporary scab on it to save the pole from going over that night. And uh, if we would have lost that pole, we would have lost uh, about six others north and east and probably and uh, the main feed in the canal substation, 120 kb feed in the substation. The concentrated efforts between the pole crew and uh, and my crew uh, just worked out really nice. Oh, I put in, uh, oh, I about 80 overtime hours, I guess, right in there. Yeah, I got, it wasn't too bad, but just long hours, being away from home, and not eating my wife's cooking. <laughs> that, that hurt. The customers I, they were, were marvelous. They were very understanding. Uh, people were out power for, for days, and they all were uh, happy to see us. Not all of the action took place in the field. Customer service reps downtown answered up to 1,300 calls per hour and fielded calls 24 hours a day until all customers were restored. Okay, I worked Wednesday, I came back midnight Wednesday night and worked all night and then all the next day. And Friday I worked all day until midnight and then came back midnight Saturday night. And I don't remember there ever being that um, the outages going on that long before. I, I thought that the field crews should hear that that, uh, uh, that we're appreciative of, of what, what it is that they've been doing. Uh, you know, we sit in the office and we're comfortable and we're, uh, we have heat and light and all this sort of thing. And uh, so they're out there battling the elements and I think that uh, it would be good if they heard that we, we're, you know, we're very pleased <laughs> that they're doing what they're doing and they're doing such a good job. Well, I worked at the Park Control Center and um, Working with them was a very different experience for me based on customer service. And uh, those guys worked really hard when they were trying to get the power back on. They also had to handle some of the calls that customer service received, so it was a new experience for them. Missed of several of my calls, you know, as I was trying to, you know, just kind of feel the concern and, you know, and let the customer know, you know, that we were really concerned and our crews are out there really working very hard to do all that they can do to really, you know, get your power back on as soon as possible. You know, in the midst of the call, you know, they'll just say, well, hey, suddenly my power came back on. And, you know, I felt real good each time that happened. And that happened, you know, at least four times maybe. And I felt really, really good with that. The storm will long be remembered as one of the worst on record. After we're put to the test in a crisis, we're all relieved to get back to the normal routine. But those routines are changing with new management practices under Superintendent Bradley's direction. As she promised when she came to work at City Light, regular face-to-face -face meetings with employees are being held quarterly. In rooms packed to overflowing, Roberta reported on the status of issues from the first session and went over her report card. We asked Roberta what points she wants to emphasize to employees at City Light. I'm very concerned about statements that I've heard that people who have wanted to speak up about issues such as sexual harassment or any other workplace issues are afraid or hesitant to do so because of fear of recrimination or retaliation. I want to tell you that that kind of behavior is unacceptable and will not be tolerated. Um, I think it's a power trip that I certainly am not on and I don't expect other people in this organization to be on either. That we need to work to val value everyone in this organization and that if people have valuable and valid concerns, they need to feel free. This is America. They need to feel free to, spe to step forward and say, I have an issue or I'm not being treated well or I know of a way that we can improve the process that, I'm the, the, that we do in my everyday work. People need to feel free that they can step forward and that they can speak up. And retaliation and recrimination will not be tolerated and it will be dealt with directly by me very, very seriously. We want to update you on a couple of important utility issues, the first being rates. The City Council is currently considering a proposed 9.2% rate increase to replace the current 10% drought surcharge. 
This new rate would take effect in May of this year and increase another 3.1% in 1994. Despite the fact that it appears days of cheap electricity in the Northwest are over, Seattle City Light still boasts the nation's lowest rates compared with other major cities. Last month, we were hoping to bring you better news about our water resources. But the situation hasn't improved since our last report. Snow surveys combined with low rainfall in January mean low water levels for the second consecutive year. Coming on top of the 1992 losses, this year looks bad. The rate increase picture could change before the final decisions are made. We'll keep you informed on NTV and with complete reports in your written edition of Network. As things change around the utility, some things that have been in the works a long time are making their debut. This one may be coming soon to a workstation near you. Marlene Blake is happy to have the old Univac removed from her work area. Her IBM terminal can now access MMS, the new materials management system. A group of City Light employees spent nearly two years working on the system with input from material control, warehousers, engineers, and stores accounting. The system is accessible on the IBM mainframe. The old system was limited to 24 users. At any given time, the utility stocks 13 to 16 million dollars of inventory. Cables, transformers, poles, bolts, things we need for everyday operations at City Light. Quick access to supplies, where they're located, and a more automatic ordering process means jobs can be scheduled with confidence that materials will be on hand. Now, I guess one of the most um, striking attributes is that our old MMS system was a batch overnight update system. That is, uh, you could input transactions today and you wouldn't see the results of those transactions until the following day, or in some cases until uh, after the weekly reports were ran, or even a week later. Um, with this system, uh, we now have the capability to have online real-time updating of, uh, of MMS uh, transactions and functions. So uh, what you'll see when you inquire into MMS is the latest and greatest information that is available regarding material requirements uh, and material availability at all of our warehouse locations. The MMS group says the new system consolidates eight issue forms into one form and eliminates 19 other forms. And since more than 140 utilities nationwide already use a similar system, it's been tested and well received. A hundred City Light employees have already learned how to use the new system, and many more will be training over the next several months. You know, Sharon, filling in as co-host for NTV has been a great experience. I've had the chance to see what it takes to put together a production like this, as well as a chance to see what my fellow co-workers around the utility are doing. It's been a lot of fun, and some of you may be interested in participating. Be on the lookout for an all-employee bulletin. We'll be sending it out, and you can return it to indicate your interest. Superintendent Roberta Palm Bradley took the podium as MC at the annual Martin Luther King Day dinner. Many City Light employees attended the event, sponsored by the Blacks and Government Association. Another major event took place early this month as City Light celebrated the topping out of the last three years of apprentices. These employees put in years of hard work and training to take their place as journey level line workers and electrical constructors. Congratulations to all of them for continuing our tradition of excellence at City Light. Well, that wraps up this edition of NTV. Let us know about the activities and projects that you're working on that might make an interesting story for your fellow City Light employees. Give us a call at 684-3112 or write NTV, room 809, City Light Building. We'll look forward to hearing from you. For NTV, I'm Mike McClure. And I'm Sharon Bennett. See you next month.